pleased to help with court sheriff work. Lay magistrate speaks on serious crimes by youth. And New Island and Bougainville renew peace ties. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thank you for joining me for Tuesday's news. The work of court sheriffs in the country will be boosted with the help of the police. The police signed a tri-party MOU with the sheriff's office and the courts today to ensure that certain police officers who can act as sheriffs will now execute those duties. The MOU formalizes a long-standing relationship between the sheriff's office and that of the police, something that has not been utilized for decades. He brought out this uh, very old colonial, colonial document that tells me that officers of the Royal Papua New Guinea Constabulary are sheriff officers. Under this agreement, commissioned police officers such as the provincial police commanders will be given powers to act as sheriffs. The responsibility for the execution of court process will lie primarily with the sheriff of Papua New Guinea who is answerable to the courts. And the sheriff officers, including commissioned police officers, you will be responsible to the sheriff of Papua New Guinea. It's important to note, you know, as uh, being mentioned by the Chief Justice, 5,000 bench warrants are outstanding for, you know, for execution. Obviously, that forms part of our responsibilities back uh, in the provinces where this exists. This MOU comes as a relief for the sheriff's office as it boosts its numbers. Currently, there are 21 serving sheriffs in the country. We are now building capacity in different areas of the judiciary, and of course, uh, sheriff, uh, we are also looking at building up its capacity. Every uh, resident in uh, all our courthouses around the country, so that uh, court orders can be efficiently uh, enforced. We've not touched the bench warrants yet, but after this MOU, uh, it will go into that. But We've been executing orders like rate of levy of properties uh, from the national courts. We've been executing uh, uh, rate of deliveries, rate of sequestrations. Uh, we've been saving um, documents. It, it's been a tough job. The MOU will be for three years. It also covers the arrangement that the Sheriff's Office and the National Judicial Service will amalgamate. Is that the Sheriff of Papua New Guinea will take over the role of providing services, security services for the courts. And for the possibility of a police post to be established within the court premises. Sarah Aupong, National MTV News. A lay magistrate says there is a noticeable increase in the number of serious crimes committed by young people aged between 14 and 18. District Court Magistrate Jeremiah Singumat says children as young as 14 are now committing offenses which include violent sexual offenses. Singumat says 7 out of 10 people attending court are young offenders. Martha Lewis with this report. Magistrate Singumat says most of the sexual offenses are committed by family members of the victims. About six out of ten cases that go through his courtroom are committed by the family members of young victims. He adds children as young as four years become victims of their own family members or relatives. In, in, in our courts, especially in my court, committal court, uh, Milukim, uh, all offenders and all committing sexual sex related offenses i'm all all family about 50 to 60 percent are family members of these very young victims the trend of the young age group committing sexual offenses as well as serious crimes like robbery is shocking he says it has come to the stage where the magistrate is issuing warnings for families to be cautious of their male family members especially children under 18 years. Time only look at them, or legally picking whether they are guardians or parents, and all must be very careful. I think the police agree with me that 
offenses of sexual nature and become a plant so. The magistrate made these remarks during the opening of a week-long Pekinini witness workshop yesterday. To try to enable these people to uh, be able to engage productively with the children that have suffered this, uh, this trauma and to get evidence that is admissible to court. The training is funded by the Australian Federal Police. The workshop focuses on interviewing children who have suffered from trauma or assault. 20 police officers from across Morobe are part of this training. Five detectives from the Queensland Police who are experts in this field are conducting the training. Interviewing children that have suffered from uh, some sort of trauma event, uh, some sort of assault, is very difficult because it's hard to get the children to talk about this from times. So it takes special skills. And what Mata Luis, National and TV News, Lay. A mother in Port Moresby is pleading with the public for help after her child was kidnapped over the weekend. Lottie Moses told MTV News her son, who is a year and six months old, was abducted from in front of their home at Morata 1. A missing persons report has been filed with Baroko Police. I'm come outside the house now. It's one black, white black car. I'm come. So now only man blame not from put him go inside the car and then I'm go. Osem so mila talk save osem. Osa ti look him sa lili boy blue me. Sa picture on need so. Give me a call on that number, my phone number. So osa ti pay him lili boy star lo one ma pem you got reward blue star. And New Guinea has been given the green light to resume its Fokker jet services to Hoskins Airport in West New Britain province. The services will resume this Saturday, December 3rd. The airline had cancelled services since September to allow for repair work on the runway surface. And New Guinea's F-100 and F-70 will be operating nine return services weekly between Port Moresby and Hoskins, plus an additional three weekly return service on the route from Port Moresby via Ley and Hoskins to Rabaul. Among stories after the break, renewing peace between Bougainville and New Ireland and Unitech yet to get funding for the burnt down mass during the student unrest. Stay tuned for details. Welcome back. The people of New Ireland and Bougainville have had a long-standing relationship, one that was sealed by way of a peace ceremony eight years ago following the Bougainville conflict. The conflict had a huge impact on the two neighboring island provinces, partly because current New Ireland Governor Sir Julius Chan was accused of hiring mercenaries to end the Bougainville War. Peace was restored years after the war and the relationship continues to prosper today. Last week, delegates led by South Bougainville member Timothy Masiu and former BRA commander Sam Kaona renewed this peace gesture in New Island province. Melissa Govero walks us through the events leading up to the ceremony. Masiu and his entourage were greeted at the airport by Ben Micah, who set aside his role as KVANG's MP for a head chief representing his people accompanied by locally revered chiefs known as Mai Mais. The leaves in their hands, known as Dalman to New Islanders, were symbolic of peace and unity. The spear is symbolic of leadership and decreed respect for whoever it was given to. It was handed to Kauna, who to New Islanders was an icon for his role in the Bougainville crisis and until Tuesday the 14th of November was a voice only ever heard over the radio. Early the next morning, the Bougainville delegates met with New Island leaders at the KVN Catholic Diocese grounds. Here, almost a decade ago, a coconut tree was planted to seal an agreement of peace between the leaders of both provinces. Our leadership only time back, this plan, original indigenous link, where we've been stabbed before yet. 
Josephine Kauna, Sam's wife, represented the women of Bougainville, who traditionally had the final say in everything, and along with children, suffered the crisis the most. Long time looking sign, Wetupla, leader Elaine Foundation, long walk about blow me plan inside the peace process, me and my mass. Masiu acknowledged the great leaders for setting the platform for the peace process to move forward. But among leaders, Byron Chan, who was only a boy at the time, was privileged to have witnessed the initial ceremony. Only put him a bureau alongside. Only kai kai boy. Only spit him boy along this play hall. Only plan him. Okay, And uh, I was a witness to that. Melissa Gaviro, National MTV News. The University of Technology still has not received funding promised for the construction of a new massing facility for the campus after the old mass was burned during the crisis earlier this year. Catering company IPI, meanwhile, has spent over a million kina to build a temporary mass, but it remains uncertain how their costs will be recovered. Within a space of a month, the IPI group of companies set up this temporary mess using its own resources. The missing facility, now located at the university's Union Hall, caters to more than 2,000 students who have resumed classes after the crisis earlier this year. But there is still uncertainty over the funding that's supposed to come from the national government to rebuild the infrastructure destroyed earlier this year. So the government promised uh, all the universities some extra funds uh, to uh, uh, you know, restore and repair after the uh, crisis of last year. But those funds have not, uh, have not arrived yet. Um, so instead we have our operational funds. And we have gotten some support there because of um, our academic year being longer now than it uh, was originally planned. But um, so we hope we can finish this year without further uh, uh, problems and disruptions. Um, we had to compress uh, you know, the academic year. It has been a difficult year for the university. While Unitech has tried to remain above the tensions one student was killed and several buildings were destroyed during protests calling for the Prime Minister to resign. We know that we've been allocated 40 million kina and um, we know that with, with our current you know, best efforts we need 45 million kina to run the university and the, the two colleges. So if they take away 5 million kina we will have to give back the colleges. As they wait for the promised 40 million kina that has not yet arrived, they also have to plan for a 5 million kina budget cut in 2017, which could result in the closure of one university college. Scott Wyde, National MTV News, Lay. Opposition leader Don Pollier has called for the removal of the government's new housing tax. He made the comments today saying the tax will be harsh on employees and it will lead to family tensions and social stress. Mr. Pollier said the government needs to address this matter in the first sitting of parliament in 2017. I urge the treasurer and the prime minister to come back to parliament next year in January with a supplementary budget to review this old budget. I also ask them to uh, tell the truth about the budget, that the budget in 2017 is not 12.9 billion, but it is 22 billion, it is 21.7 billion in the budget. They need to come back to parliament next year in January and introduce a supplementary budget that corrects the 2016 budget and also correct the 2017 budget. And a significant component of the correction should be abolish this housing taxation on Papua New Guinea employees because it will affect the family very much. In the meantime, Treasury Minister Patrick Pruage explained that only two categories of high-income employees will be affected by 2017 tax change exchange. 
Mr. Puraj said there has been a misunderstanding on taxation of employee provided housing in the 2017 national budget, which has led to public confusion and controversy. He said the 2017 national budget only extended taxes that have been implemented since 2011 to include two new categories that encompass very high housing rentals. In a related measure, the government has also decided to fully tax employer-provided accommodation outside of Papua New Guinea because the current exemption for this category is overly generous and unfair from a policy perspective. And now looking at our finance news, the Kina closed unchanged at 0 0.3150 US dollars in the interbank markets. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0 0.3075 US dollars, 0 0.4085 Australian dollars, 0 0.2873 Euro and 34.13 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, coffee and copper closed higher while gold and cocoa closed the day lower. Palm oil and crude oil closed lower while copper closed the day higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 54.24 points lower, the ASX is trading at 6.9 points lower, and the All Ordinaries is trading at 12.14 points lower. National MTV News continues after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. Solomon Islands High Commissioner to Papua New Guinea, Barnabas Anga, says that through the South-South Corporation, other islands in the Pacific will adopt some innovative ideas that have been developed by Papua New Guineans. With Papua New Guinea seen as the leading island nation, this will enable other nations to engage more with their big sister country. High Commissioner Barnabas Anga made a diplomatic presence in the Regional Knowledge Exchange Workshop in Podmosby. He says such workshops are a window of opportunities for knowledge exchange through the South South Corporation. The meeting discussed ways to strengthen anti-corruption initiatives with citizens through the use of information communication technology. This will help state institutions, agencies and citizens improve public service delivery. Both countries, including Solomon Islands, uh, has made attempts to really put the structure in place and uh, put the operational uh, initiatives. Derek Futasi is the Deputy Secretary to the Prime Minister of Solomon Islands. An important way forward for Solomon Islands is the need to restructure government institutions to weed out corruption. So among uh, other important institutions uh, that uh, need to be um, established in Solomon Islands is, is this um, uh, anti-corruption uh, com commission. Vanuatu was represented by the policy advisor to Justice and Community Services Minister and he said to Riki Waoa. He said PNG's Phones Against Corruption, a platform jointly initiated by PNG's Finance Department and the United Nations Development Program and supported by the Australian government is worth considering. Departments of Finance innovate, innovate, Innovations, especially like uh, Funds Against Corruptions, and uh, maybe incorporate it into a national framework. Meanwhile, Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands will adopt PNG's Funds Against Corruption to scale up their anti corruption initiatives. This reporting tool through mobile phone text messaging or SMS, since introduced in 2014 has led to 77 cases investigated by PNG's Finance Department. Fabian Hucklitz, National MTV News. During its graduation ceremony, Laloki Secondary School received another pledge for assistance from the provincial member, even though pledges made by the provincial government in the past are still pending. Since Laloki Secondary School's elevation from primary to secondary in 2014, they have not received any money promised to them. Laloki Secondary School is yet to receive the 50,000 kina that was promised to them by the central provincial government. Uh, when we celebrate our 30th anniversary in 2013, uh, 
governor pledged for 50,000. We never got it money. The central provincial administrator said there are reasons as to why there were delays for the funds to be sent to the school. Uh, that never came to my attention, so I was not able. But uh, now that they have mentioned it, uh, I've told uh, the audience and also the crowd here that you know that the, the principal will have to come and uh, see me on that, and then uh, we will uh, make good uh, the amount that uh, that was promised to them. The member for Kairuku, Hiri Peter Isoaimo, pledged another 50,000 kina to the school during the graduation ceremony yesterday. Uh, with him making that pledge today and promising us that we will get that money, we are looking forward to it. The school has 820 students, of which only 28 are boarding, while 440 are day students. The school has projects to be completed, yet funding is a factor that is halting these plans. We have some, some money from the TFF and parents' contribution of what we call PNC support grant. Uh, we've already put up a three block of classrooms, but it's in complete now. So with that, the 50,000 that's uh, going to be given by the member, we'll use that to put the final touches to the three classrooms that we have. Gaile Kivali, National MTV News. Chukai Sports is next. Jeremy will join us on the other side of the break with highlights from this afternoon's first semi-final match between the United States and North Korea. Stay tuned. Chukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. The United States and Korea DPR played the first of the semifinal matches this afternoon. And after 120 minutes, Korea DPR won that match two goals to one. Elijah Levet with the details. And joining me here this evening to talk about that particular match, Marco Vendetti from Football First. Marco, uh, it was roughly 60% possession in favor of Korea DPR with about 25 shots on goal to seven compared to the United States. Was it always going to be Korea DPR winning this particular match? Well, surprise, surprise. In a way, we were expecting it, but uh, North Korea really, or Korea DPR, has really made the difference in this tournament. They just uh, have a perfect score, and once again, they came on top of the game. I was there at the stadium, I came back running, I'm still sweating to be here with you, and it was a fantastic game to watch. And it has been excellent. Well, thank you very much for that, Marco, and uh, we'll go for a short break this time, and coming up next, uh, heading with the weather. True Kai Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. Looking at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region only, mostly fine in all centers. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield with doing with Dulux. And that's the way it is this Tuesday, the 29th of November. Coming up next, the second semi-final of the FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup between France and Japan. That's straight after this. On behalf of the news team, pleasant viewing. Good night.